Our club has always been a forum for public figures, thought leaders, and decision makers to share their ideas. Here, we offer access to dynamic political, business, and public personalities. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome our online guests. We're now live online. My name is David Simmons. I'm president of the Canadian Club Toronto and your host for today's event. Today we're, woo! People like me, they really like me. Um, we're happy to welcome a physically distanced, fully vaccinated audience to this live event and so thrilled to be here to welcome our very special guest. We're also thrilled to welcome our online guests who are viewing virtually, and we appreciate your engagement this afternoon. As you watch today's event, please interact with us on social media. There are hashtags on your table if you're in the room, and if you're online, they appear on your screen right now. What we do individually and collectively, ooh, I misread the sentence. Let me start again. What do we need to do individually and collectively to embrace the benefits of a low carbon economy? Question mark. How do we hold governments accountable for the agreements they sign on to and the policies they draft? If you have questions for the EDC president and CEO, please take note of them on the Q&A cards on your table. We'll collect them during her talk and we'll use them in the Q&A following. If you're joining us remotely, we invite you to hit the submit a question button on your screen. You're right if you guess that that button allows you to submit a question. I get to look at them and decide which ones we'll ask. <laughs> I also like to acknowledge that there are students joining us today. A group of future climate leaders are here. Thank you to Maple Leaf Foods for your generous support and welcome to that group of students. Welcome. At this time, I'd also like to acknowledge today's event sponsors who make activities like this possible. EY is represented by Yannick Le Gauthier, partner ENY Financial Services. BLG is represented by Bruce Fowler, a partner with BLG. We appreciate your generous support. We couldn't do this without you. And now, please join me in welcoming uh, Yannick from ENY to introduce our guest speaker. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Bonjour à tous. I'm so pleased to be joining you here today representing EY and to introduce such a, a great uh, leader. Uh, we at EY are very proud to support businesses big and small alongside the export development of Canada on their exporting journey. I'm delighted to introduce uh, the leader of EDC, Marie Lavery, who's recently returned from COP26 with inspiration and ideas on how to help Canadian business even more as we transform to a greener economy, which she will uh, share with us today. But for, first, a few words about Mairead. Mairead joined EDC in 2014 and was appointed president and CEO in February 2019. She is a native of Northern Ireland, has a degree in management and accounting from Queen's University, Belfast, and is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Ireland. 
Prior to EDC, Marid, uh, Marid held executive role at Bombardier, where she managed a range of large complex portfolios over a 16-year career. As president and CEO, Mareda set out three pillars for leadership. Number one, champion for trade. Number two, ESG responsibility. Number three, inclusion, diversity, and equity. These values are at the centerpiece of her and EDC's business agenda. Under a direction, Can Canada's Export Credit Agency has pursued ambitious objectives, achieving strong growth and helping more Canadian businesses do business in 200 markets around the, the world, while generating over 1 billion in trade and investment annually. In 2020, EDC became a major contributor to the federal governmental uh, government COVID-19 economic response, helping deliver billions of dollars in liquidity to companies across Canada. EDC also stands as the single largest financier of Canadian clean tech, a proud supporter of women-owned and women-led businesses, and regularly ranks among Canada's top 100 employers. She is the first woman to occupy EDC's chief executive role in its 75-plus year history. Great accomplishment. And in 2015, Marade experienced a, uh, another very proud milestone, becoming a Canadian citizen. <laughs> We are a better country having you, Marade. Uh, and with that, I pass the Canadian club Uh, podium to Mairead Lavery. Welcome. Bienvenue. Merci Yannick. Thank you David. Key supporter there. So David I'll just look to you in the audience when I need some reinforcement of key messages. Uh, thank you for that. Good afternoon, everyone, and it's an absolute pleasure to be with you here today in the room and for all of you online as well. Thank you to the Canadian Club of Toronto for this very kind invitation and for your agility in making this uh, hybrid event work. Um, before I start my remarks, I'd like to recognize I have two very important people in the room joining me, which are two of my board members. So I have uh, our director, Manjit Sharma as well as our chair, Martin Ehrman. So we could look on this positively, or we could think of this as my year-end performance <laughs> review. <laughs> we're, we're not sure which uh, at, at this point in time. But let me start with my remarks. Uh, just over two weeks ago, I came back from Glasgow, having attended the United Nations Conference on Climate Change, also known as COP26. Yes, it is a pretty funky title, uh, David. Um, but these were the most anticipated climate discussions certainly since the Paris Accord had been signed, and arguably in our time, the most important. I was attending in my capacity as the President and CEO of Export Development Canada, and as a member of the Canadian delegation, doing my best to act as the eyes, ears, and voice for all Canadian exporters. It was an opportunity to engage with the leaders of other public and private sector financial institutions from around the world along with business leaders and entrepreneurs, all trying to make a difference in achieving the goal of addressing the biggest challenge of our time. EDC has been evolving its position on climate change for a number of years. Our view is that the economy and the environment are opposite sides of the same coin. The challenge is we don't have the luxury of tossing this coin to choose which side we will focus on. That means today, all business decisions are ultimately climate choices. The kinds of choices that were the central topic of COP26. Being in Glasgow was equal parts exciting, exhausting and sobering. It was also more than anything enlightening. Today, I would like to share some of my biggest takeaways from Glasgow. Takeaways that I would summarize as the urgency of action, the inevitability of transition, and the demand for partnerships and leadership. 
Finally, I will describe what I see as the extraordinary opportunities available to those of us who accept the reality of transition to the net zero carbon economy and then take swift action to be part of that transition. So let's start with the urgent need for action. The bottom line of the Glasgow meetings was to keep alive the possibility of limiting global temperature rise to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius over the next 30 years. It's not likely that that has been achieved from COP26. Currently, the thinking is that the Glasgow Climate Pact may keep us to a temperature rise of around 2.4 degrees. It is certainly not perfect, but it is still progress. And for the first time, climate aspirations are being supported by plans and action. The path is more clear and more people are on it. And this is absolutely critical because the stakes are rising. You may have seen this picture. This is how Simon Kofi, the foreign minister of the South Pacific nation of Tuvalu, addressed the COP26 meetings. Knee deep in the ocean on a beach that used to be dry land. His message, the message we heard again and again from leaders was very clear. Failure is not an option. What was also clear was that the 2050 deadline for net zero emissions is not the deadline that matters most. What will make the biggest difference, and really is our only hope, is in the progress we make by 2030, and that's less than 10 years from now. If we don't get the short term right, the long term outlook is bleak. Speed is absolutely of the essence. And the transition is well underway. It's a transition that spans all sectors of the global and, of course, the Canadian economy. Because all sectors have climate impacts, all will have to change. Mining, agriculture, forestry, manufacturing, transportation and infrastructure. All of these leave their marks on the planet. And in most of these areas, we're starting to see the evidence of transition. With government and industry taking steps to reduce their carbon footprints. But no sector will feel this more than the fossil fuel sectors. Don't be distracted by last minute statements on coal and the difference between phasing out and phasing down production during the COP26 discussions. The fact is that Glasgow was the first COP meeting that set explicit caps on fossil fuel emissions. Coal, methane and oil and gas have all had some form of limits applied to them. The clear signal has been sent to those with economic interests in these fossil fuel industries that the dominance of fossil fuels in our economy must come to an end. Looking for more proof? Well, then just follow the money. At the beginning of this year, Mark Carney's efforts to get net zero commitments from the global finance community had totaled $5 trillion in assets. In Glasgow, a short six months later, he announced that that number had grown to $130 trillion. And that includes Canada's six largest banks among its signatories. That, to my mind, is real evidence of an economic transition with momentum. What is required of us now is to ensure that the transition is orderly and just. And at EDC, we see a role for ourselves in this work. EDC's climate approach calls for our engagement with companies of all sizes and across every sector of the Canadian economy, including oil and gas and other high emitting sectors. For those co companies that recognize the need for change and are ready to take steps necessary to achieve low carbon goals, EDC is ready to help. For those who deny this reality, you ignore it at your peril more than simply missing out on the future opportunities that the economic and climate transition will present, I believe you will be putting your future of your business at risk. My third takeaway is about the imperative of partnerships. At the heart of the Glasgow meetings is an area called the action zone, 
a kind of town square where people from all parts of the world, representing governments, agencies, business, civil society, media, the youth, could find each other and simply talk. And this is how partnerships begin. This dynamic is important because addressing climate change is not a spectator sport. We are talking about fundamental changes to the way we have fueled economic activity for over 100 years. And these changes must happen quickly. It makes sense that doing this will require an effort from all of us. And the fact is that many of us are already engaged governments at all levels, and organizations like the one I lead. There are also the public and private sector institutions and their capital. Joined by the countless individuals and organizations around the world who regularly remind us of the imperative and who regularly assess and challenge our actions. Only by building strong partnerships between these bodies and organizations will we hope to deliver the speed and coordination necessary to meet our emission goals. But one other element is extremely crucial, leadership. Here's another face you may recognize, the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley. In powerful speeches to the UN and to COP26 meetings, Prime Minister Motley elevated herself overnight as a leading spokesperson for scores of small island and coastal nations. Her message was powerful, not only because of its eloquence, but because of how high the stakes are. Her fight is for the very survival of Barbados. Listening to her made me think about leadership and where it comes from. And that made me think about Canada. It's not overstating it to say that Barbados is on the receiving end of Canada's carbon output, which is exactly why Canadian leadership is so important. By taking a leadership role in climate action, Canada sends more than a signal to the rest of the world. We can deliver real impact, not just by the reduced emissions we achieve, but by demonstrating what is possible. If Canada can lead, and if Canada can succeed, we can help address the pleas of Prime Minister Motley while making a difference for the planet. Ours is a large economy built on natural resources and still dependent on several carbon intense sectors. If Canada is to meet its net zero objectives, all of our sectors will have to be part of the solution. And making that happen, I believe, can not only put Canada in a place of climate leadership, but can put this country on the forefront of a new wave of global economic opportunity. Which brings me to my final takeaway, opportunity. And it comes with a number attached, $2 trillion. This is from a study published last month by RBC that calculates the total price tag for Canada alone to make the transition to net zero emissions. Two trillion dollars, or just under $70 billion per year for 30 years. I know that this is an extremely large number. And I know that there is a temptation to see this only as a high cost. But we must challenge ourselves to see this as being more than a cost. Spent the right way, this can be an investment that will flow throughout the Canadian economy. Here's our Canadian GDP subdivided by major industries. This is where we generate our jobs, our wealth and our carbon footprint. And this is where that $70 billion of investment per year can chart a path to a more sustainable future. All of these economic sectors, whether we're retrofitting our homes and offices, rebuilding infrastructure, reducing waste in our manufacturing processes, or cutting the emissions in our agriculture sector, all will require new thinking new technology and new investment. And this is what I mean by opportunity. Here's how I see it. When you buy insurance, you incur a cost 
to protect yourself against a possible downside. And yes, there are elements of this downside protection in the $70 billion that we need to spend. But unlike insurance, these dollars will do more. They will effect change, unleash creativity, drive innovation, and help us transition our economy. And if you want to see that happening today, you can just look to Canada's clean technology sector. Canadian environmental and clean tech companies cut across all the industries on this diagram. Everywhere from renewable energy and water conservation to recycling and smart grids. And at EDC, we've had a front row seat to this Canadian success story. In less than a decade, EDC has helped generate almost $14 billion in clean technology exports. And that makes us a leading financier of Canadian clean tech. And while I'm proud of that record and of the team, it's not a title that I'm possessive of. There is plenty of room for more investment. In fact, the sector is hungry for it. In 2019, the environmental and clean tech sector was worth more than $70 billion in Canada and responsible for more than 340,000 Canadian jobs. Now, if you doubt about the urgency of making these investments, I have one more chart to share. This shows projections for the global economic impact of climate change over the next decades, seen through the lens of three different scenarios. The first three bars show the impact of acting now and achieving net zero by 2050. Get this right, and we are still confronting a GDP loss in the range of 2% or so. But the second three bars shows what happens if we delay. And the third shows what happens if we take no action. Clearly, whatever the cost of achieving a transition is, the price of failing to act in our global economy is far, far greater. So let me finish with one more photograph from Glasgow. This was also taken at the Action Zone. And the man I'm standing next to is Stéphane Germain, the CEO of GHG SAT. This Canadian company and EDC customer uses satellite imagery to monitor and analyze industrial GHG emissions around the world. Today, they have two satellites orbiting Earth and have plans to put 10 more in orbit by 2023. Stefan and his company are part of the new Canadian climate economy, the economic and environmental transition that will help us all address the greatest challenge of our time. Stefan is doing his part. My question is, are we doing our part? That may sound like a challenge, and it is, but it is also an invitation. EDC has been watching the opportunities of a low carbon transition grow for years now. If you see those opportunities too, then you should know that you have a partner here in EDC that is willing to work with you. If you don't or cannot see these opportunities, then I can only tell you, you're looking in the wrong place. And if you do see them and aren't taking any action, my only question is, what are you waiting for? Thank you very much for your time. Great speech. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> uh, I have some questions here from the audience. I know Colleen's monitoring the online questions, so we're going to participate in the Q&A here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, these are very good questions, but I'm going to ask you, because you were at COP26, I'm going to make my own question up. Uh, there's some emotion in the speech that you just delivered. 
um, coupled with fact, and the fact is clear, it came through. Um, can you talk about what it's like to be the CEO of an organization uh, where emotion is colliding with an urgency of now? Like, what's that like for you? <laughs> well, as a CEO, it's never actually good when emotion class <laughs> clashes yeah. with fact. Um, but but it's, this is one of the compelling challenges of our time. And uh, why I get so emotional about it is I do believe Canada has such an opportunity to lead. I think this is a moment in time where Canada can step in and lead from the front. And I believe not, not only can we do it because we have the best talent, we have the best technologies uh, in, in the world, I, I just see it as such an imperative for our own economy, for Canada to continue with the lifestyle that Canada has. It needs to change and it needs to be at the forefront of that change. I, I have a personal mantra, which is I would much prefer to be leading from the front and making change happen than having change happen to me. And that's the opportunity I see for Canada, the ability to lead uh, from the front. So yes, there is emotion. Some of my customers uh, enjoy that. Some of them enjoy the facts more, but the challenge is in front of us. When I talk to customers in our carbon intense sectors, they recognize this challenge. Their financiers are telling them this, the market is telling them that, investors, their customers are telling, and I think we're going to see more of that as customers tell our companies what they expect of them. So, so yeah, I think we should be emotional. We are handing to a generation of new CEOs, a very big challenge, and we need to do what we can to make that easier for them going forward. It's a very clear answer, um, informed by perspective and data, so thank you. You talked a lot about transition in your remarks. I heard in the lobby conversations, smooth transition, just transition, thoughtful transition, and then I saw your slide that showed the GDP. And you talked about the unique position that Canada is in, and the extractive industries were very high on our GDP. Guidance, steer, thoughts. How do we have a thoughtful conversation about the the opportunity and challenge in front of us? Yeah, thank you for that. It's a it's a great question, and certainly the words are just that at the moment, which is words orderly, just. And if you talk to anyone in the risk environment, they certainly want to talk about orderly versus disorderly transition because of the implications of that. But this is actually stepping back and, and making some fundamental changes to what we consider the purpose of organizations to be, the interactions we have with our workers and how we prepare them for the jobs of the future, and how we actually take ownership and responsibility for making changes that are going to impact the Canadian economy for a long time forward. I don't think there is a silver bullet, and certainly as we look as we look out there, it's going to take all of us coming to the table as consumers, as investors, to actually help guide uh, companies as to what they might need to do and to drive the speed of action. And then it's going to take government with regulation. It's going to take government with investment into new technologies. It's going to take research and development in the companies that are in the carbon sectors. It's going to take us perhaps taking more risk and less return to ensure that we are investing today for the future. So these are fundamental changes to how we think the economy can actually work. And, and that's what's really quite difficult about it. I think there's lots of ideas out there and certainly at COP26, that's what you see. Many people come to the table. I would say our youth have lots of ideas of what can be done. Um, and we have to put all the best brains to work uh, to actually make sure that we are um, working on a just transition um, and we don't have that much time to do it. So, uh, so yeah, I, I don't see any wrong idea in this environment for uh, actually what transition will look like. There's a part of me that feels like I'm in a case simulation. <laughs> but I'm in like a, I'm at HBS, I'm at Wharton, I'm at Ivy, the best business school in Canada. Um, and and I'm, I'm, you know, you're throwing these variables at me as I'm trying to solve for this. I mean, one of the really important, I think, processes that you probably follow, we have to be really clear on the problem we're trying to solve for. If you could just sort of send a signal to Bay Street today on the problem we're trying to solve for, what is that simply? Well, um... So first off, um, it's not a business case. I would say if you're sitting in British Columbia today, you would say it's clearly not a, bu a business case study. It's real. It's happening all around us, and we truly need uh, we truly need to address it. 
If I was specifically addressing Bay Street, which is your question, I'm going to surmise that most of Bay Street uh, is made up of bankers. And I think they're already indicating the direction they want to go with signing up to Mark Carney's GFANS, the Glasgow Financial Alliance. They're already starting to say, we have to pivot our assets this direction. Do they have uh, all the plans in place to make that happen? No, there's a lot of aspiration and policies out there. My main message to them is don't delay. We have to get going. 2030 is incredibly important. And uh, net zero commitments of 2050 are indicative of the path we must follow, but action is more important than perfection. Wow, I'm gonna use that one. Um, questions from the room, please keep submitting them and online as well. There's a question here around EDC's approach to supporting smaller Canadian tech companies. Uh, to scale as part of the solution. Do you do that? How do you do that advice? Yeah, so we have to do this. We have to help um, all of companies of all sizes and our smaller companies are where some of this truly innovative technology is sitting. So what a great opportunity to leverage Canadian technology. And, and remember, we're solving a global problem. So as much as we encourage Canadian companies to seize the opportunity that presents itself in Canada, it's actually the opportunity to take that technology to the world and solve the world's problems. So, so yes, we do. We support Canadian small companies in many different ways um, through all of our financial products. And I think most importantly, going forward, will be lots of the knowledge and advice that we can bring to them, specifically around ESG. And today I was talking about the environment, but it's a tough business environment out there today. You know, it's post-pandemic. What does post-pandemic recovery mean? Many small businesses challenged with the impact the pandemic has had on their business. How do we give them the strength to invest in R&D? How do we help them recruit talent? How do we help them? And I know Dennis is in the audience, something he talks a lot about is how do we help them invest in technology and automation to actually improve their chances of getting this, uh, their technologies to market? And how do we bridge the gap from having a great idea to having a commercial solution and do that much faster? So yes, we're really trying to work with our smaller companies to help them do that, uh, as well as our medium-sized companies, as well as our large companies. Because guess what? Large companies employ small companies in their supply chain. So this is an ecosystem play. It's not going to be one size of company, one sector. It's going to be all of us as stakeholders to this problem that we'll have to solve. There's a question around carbon capture, storage, mm -hmm. utilization, and what role uh, they might play as tools in the, in the process. Uh, do you have thoughts? I do. I do have thoughts on carbon capture. Um, I think carbon capture and, uh, and storage is an exciting technology. Um, it's going to be one of the technologies that's going to help remove carbon from the environment. And we're still going to have to do the tough, uh, the tough things like reduce the amount of carbon we're putting into the environment, as well as utilize um, tools such as carbon capture and storage. Interestingly, I think Canada has a real advantage uh, in this space. We have many companies that are at the leading edge of this, many companies that are the leading edge of equally additionally new energy sources like hydrogen. So, so we really need to understand some of the strengths that Canada has and, and help support those companies get to the commercialization stage. When you talk carbon capture, you know, I always have this analogy, like it's not a handheld fan that's sucking carbon in right beside you. We are talking globally scaled industrial plants that are needed for carbon capture and storage. That requires investment, that requires a different risk return equation, and that's what I would say to Bay Street. That can be the future, and that's where the return comes from the future. Someone in the audience acknowledged that you made a net zero commitment on behalf of EDC in June of this year. Can you describe uh, your decision making and approach and how you plan to get there? Yeah, I can. Um, the first thing I will tell you is it took a long time. Uh, I would say that's the combination of 10 years of getting to that point from starting to think about clean technology as a priority for EDC to going to issue green bonds where we were clearly raising funds to invest in green projects back in 2014, right through to a very long process to get us to a climate uh, policy in 2019. 
and, and even in 2015, we stopped support for coal, coal-fired infrastructure. So it's a journey, David, is what I would say. And net zero was just the next logical step on the journey, but it is just that, it's a journey to 2050. I think it's taken my team quite a bit of time. I'm glad I have two board members here. We had to talk to our board about that. What does that mean? to the business that we're running? What does it mean to the talent that we have? Where do we need to invest? Where are the pivots? Like it's not without its challenges. And I would say it is just that it's a pit stop along the way because now we need to invest in science in, in science in particular. How do we help our companies? How do we use science to help them? How do we use technology? How do we work with them to understand where we could be helpful? So for example, our financing, our, our even just the requirements of our support now comes with uh, disclosure requirements that helps companies start to see the risks. So we're always talking to them about the risks and opportunities. So for us, this is just a moment in time. Now we really need to make our actions much more visible, much more concrete, grounded in science, so that we have really clear actions for our employees because we need to be net zero as a business. Um, that's the first off and then for our customers as well as then uh, ensuring that all our stakeholders know where we're going and the different steps that we've identified to get there and uh, it, it will it's going to take many different steps what gives you hope in this there's a lot of um what you know you get up every morning you're running a large organization <laughs> what what makes you hopeful in the midst of all this yeah, I think there's a couple of things that make me hopeful. Um, number one is uh, is our youth. And number one certainly is uh, my younger employees at EDC who, who don't want us to step away from this challenge. They want us to step up to the challenge and, 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 and are willing to, to work with us and give us guidance, knowing that this is their legacy that they are receiving. So I think youth is number one that gives me a lot of hope. Um, Number two is is the opportunity or the solutions that already exist. There are things that we can do um, that are already out there. That so so technologies that perhaps not everyone is familiar with. But when we talk clean technology, we're talking renewable energy. We're talking water conservation. We're talking soil protection. So these concepts that we talk about, like biodiversity and nature, there are solutions to try and help. So. I see that as encouraging. I think anytime there has been um, there has been challenges presented, our great minds in this country have come to the challenge and can actually bring solutions to the table. Um, so that gives me a lot of hope and encouragement. I think in Canada, you know, we have to be very clear. We have a natural resource-based economy. What gives me hope is when I talk to the more carbon intense sectors, they get it, they're working on it, they have a plan and they want someone to help them with that. And they want that recognized. So, so that's the idea of partnership that in fact, um, our, our industries are not blind to this problem. They're actually looking for partners to try and help with them. So all of that gives me a lot of hope. Let's end on a hopeful note, shall we? <laughs> I'm gonna approach the podium and give you a formal thank you now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Round of applause for our speaker. <laughs> Mairead's lucky because I'm a hugger. Um, and people are like, why are you hugging me? But now, Kobe, you don't have to do that anymore. On behalf of the Canadian Club Toronto, I want to thank you for your passionate message and encouraging decorum in the discourse around climate change and the role that we should play as Canadians in business, uh, in politics, and in civil society. We can all see why EDC is doing so well under your intentional and inspiring leadership. I truly stood in the corner there and I'm like, wow, she's impressive. <laughs> Note that for the year-end review. Um, your message of urgency, purpose, and hope calls on each of us to tackle the climate change collectively. This is no longer a distant consideration. It's an urgent and important problem. Uh, let me take this opportunity to wish you the best on your, on your endeavor. Uh, and as a colleague in this space, I look forward to collective action. We're going to take a little break over the holidays. Um, I can't believe I'm saying that, over the holidays. Like Hanukkah is like around the corner. 
Like it gets like it, it's the end of the year. Um, and we're going to look uh, to welcome you all back in early 2022. 2022. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, our first event in the new year will be in person pending any, you know, shifts in the uh, global situation. It's going to be our 45th annual outlook that features the best in political and economic punditry and truth telling. It's Tuesday, January the 4th. It's going to be at lunch this year. You can join us in person or virtually. We hope you'll make it. Is our moderator for that our normal moderator, Colleen? It's Bruce. Is, is, I don't, you won't, I, we, I shouldn't say who's on the panel. Amanda Lang's coming. Scotiabank's coming. It's going to be lit, as the young kids say. <laughs> Before I close today, I want to extend another round of applause and thank you to ENY and BLG. It says clap in my script. <laughs> and let me conclude our time together by also thanking livemeeting.ca, Canada's online event space, and BBC for your live streaming of today's event. I'm also going to thank Mike. Mike comes and takes our photos all the time. You're amazing, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for being here. This ends the meeting. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day.